everyone. It's my immense pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Kimberly Manning. Dr. Manning received her MD degree from Meharry Medical College and completed her internship, residency, and chief residency in the combined internal medicine and pediatrics program at Case Western Reserve University and Metro Health Medical Center. Dr. Manning joined the faculty at the Emory University School of Medicine, where she has risen through the ranks to professor of medicine and serves as the associate vice chair of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Department of Medicine at Emory University. Dr. Manning is a passionate clinician educator and a general internist and hospitalist, caring for patients and training medical students and residents at Grady Memorial Hospital. She also serves as the residency program director for the transitional year internship. Dr. Manning has received numerous teaching awards from students and residents, including the Golden Stethoscope Award multiple times and the Department of Medicine Educator Impact Award. In 2018, she was awarded the prestigious ACGME Parker J. Palmer Courage to Teach Award which is given to only nine program directors across all ACGME residency programs in the country. At Emory, she has received the Evangeline Papa George Award, the Golden Apple Teaching Award, and the Juhu P. Coco Teaching Award, the highest teaching awards in the School of Medicine, Grady Hospital, and Emory's internal medicine residency programs. Dr. Manning has a strong passion for building and strengthening diverse clinical learning environments, as well as cultivating psychologically safe learning climates. Her work on bias has been published in such prestigious journals as the Annals of Internal Medicine, Academic Medicine, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. Dr. Manning will be speaking today about, I may be biased, what can I do about it? Dr. Manning, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It is really my pleasure um, to be in, be in uh, San Diego. Um, I am uh, a West Coast girl at heart, and so um, I do wish I could be with you in person, but uh, this will have to do, and let's make the most of it. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you all today about bias um, and what we can do about it. Um, I have no financial disclosures, but I do have one disclosure, and it is that um, I do have bias, spoiler alert. <laughs> and um, I'm also just trying to uh, work through it just like everyone else. So instead of you looking at this as <clears throat> me standing before you and telling you what you need to do, think of us as in a huddle, all together trying to figure out how to mitigate bias. Every talk I give, I always begin with gratitude. And that's because um, it's so easy to get so caught up in all of the data and all the things that you're talking about that you run out of time and you don't get an opportunity to really thank people. Um, today, uh, I like to just start with gratitude for our students at Emory who really um, push me to think a lot about how to be um, a better role model and also how to create spaces for them where they can um, thrive and be their full selves. And that really calls for us to be thinking about things like implicit bias and all of those things that create barriers for us being our very best. I'd like to start by making an introduction to you. Um, this is Dr. Janice Lee. Jan Dr. Janice Lee is a nephrologist here at Emory. And in 2009, Dr. Janice Lee became the first African-American woman to reach the rank of full professor at Emory University School of Med, Emory University's Department of Medicine. And um, that's significant considering that our Department of Medicine has been around since the 1800s. Um, just a few years later in 2013, this woman, Dr. Jada Bussey Jones, who's my mentor, um, would uh, also become full professor, followed by Dr. Stacy Higgins, who's our primary care residency program director. And then followed by Dr. Jennifer Christie um, in 2018, um, a gastroenterologist and endoscopist here at Emory. And this is really significant because uh, 38,074 individuals in the US and US medical schools as of um, 2015, according to the double AMC, had achieved the rank of full professor. But of that 38,074, only 269 of them are black women. Um, 
I'm happy to say that as of this year, that number is now 270. And so um, stay with me because this is really significant in terms of the spaces that we create and um, how bias plays into all of this. You know, I started to spend my time with you all today um, sharing with you all the studies about the things that take, um, that stop a, a medical student like me here in 1995 um, and create these barriers to derail her from becoming a full professor or to adding uh, to that 269 women, right? Um, you know, I started to share with you studies about residency letters and the bias that we see there for gender and race. Um, kind of thought about like, well, maybe learner assessments. We could talk a little bit about um, bias that shows up in our learner assessments and even how implicit bias can amplify the imposter syndrome. I started to spend time talking to you about that. And then I said, you know, maybe the people at UCSD would prefer for me to give them all the studies, you know, about the clinical environment, you know, share with them iconic studies like this one from Shulman that um, described um, four different actors, uh, a black woman, a black man, a white woman, a white man, all of whom were scripted with the exact same clinical scenario, um, but who, as you all know from hearing of this study, all were had different um, outcomes from uh, what doctors did in terms of sending them for cardiac catheterization. And that was deeply linked to bias. Started to spend time talking about that, but I thought, you know what, my colleagues at UCSD, they saw that study, they know this already. And then I said, you know, I'm a storyteller. How about I just tell you the story of my own father um, who presented to an emergency department in Los Angeles um, with a family history, with hyperlipidemia, with um, hypertension, with um, crushing, aching pain between his shoulder blades that wouldn't go away, that came on exertion, and, and how he was sent home. And then I could tell you about how I made him go back to the hospital, and even when he got there and he had a troponin of 22, it wasn't until seven to eight hours later when I pleaded with a cardiologist to cath him that he received a cath. Um, I could tell you about stuff like that, but, you know, instead I thought, you know, what we really should do is not just talk about all of these awful things that have happened in the hands of bias because we know that they have happened. Instead, what can we do? How can we be better? How can we move forward and, and, and tackle our own biases and move to that next step, which is action? And so we'll spend some time uh, talking a little bit about what bi bias is. I mean, um, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, when it sort of rears its ugly head, um, why it happens and, and why it's so important for us to, to work to mitigate our biases. But mostly we'll talk a little bit about how we can take this learning that we have about bias and transform it into changes in what we do, right? So these are pretty straightforward and practical objectives for you today. So, um, I do admit I am still a storyteller at heart. And so I'd like to start with a practical um, 60 second snapshot. So come with me to Grady Memorial Hospital where I work um, as a hospital as a generalist. And on this particular day, I had come down to the emergency department um, with my team. We had been that on all. And um, we had admitted a few patients and there was one more patient left for us to see. And my senior resident said, hey, Dr. Manning, can you please just meet me down in the emergency department? Um, we'll be down there shortly. Now, this was pre-COVID, but I, I'm not a big fan of waiting for long elevators. And so I had jot, ran down the stairs and waited for my team to come and beat them there. And as I stood there waiting in the emergency department, this is what was around me. The first thing I saw was a black woman who appeared elderly. She was sitting in a chair. She had um, a blanket over her shoulders that looked like it belonged to um, a child and her little, um, but I think it's her granddaughter was combing her hair with one of those hospital issue combs. I looked over at her and smiled. Then I looked um, straight ahead and I saw a young white male um, who was sitting on a gurney. He was dressed in designer clothing, very nice. He had a um, clean haircut. Um, he was shaved. He looked to be um, probably a college student. Um, he was wearing the newest Air Jordans. <clears throat> that I knew for sure because I have uh, teenage sons. And uh, he was scrolling through a um, smartphone. And I asked myself, what is he doing here at Grady at our safety net hospital? Over to my left, there was a couple speaking Spanish. 
a man who was sitting and looking tired on his left arm, there was an AV graft that I saw. And the woman that was with him was sitting on his lap, speaking softly in Spanish and looked very worried. Suddenly there was a loud cacophony of sound that came uh, my way. A woman was screaming in my direction, asking if I was her doctor. Um, she was sweating, her blonde hair was paced to her eyes and her blue eyes were wide open like saucers. And she was screaming. Um, and um, I just sort of looked and kind of broke eye contact with her. Next, there was a loud sound, not an unusual sound in Grady, um, where I saw some officers uh, come in with a young black man um, who had a plastic tie, tied with his arms tied behind his back. Um, his belt had been removed, his pants were falling down, um, he was shirtless. He reminded me of um, my oldest son um, in complexion and appearance. And uh, I just remember looking and thinking, I wonder what could have happened to cause these officers to treat him so rough and that I hope he lives. And then someone tapped me on the shoulder. It was a nurse with a very high BMI. I didn't know her, um, but she was asking me if this patient that she had was my patient and she needed me to write an order. So these were all the things that were happening around me. And I hope that as I said these things, you began reflecting a little bit on how bias could play into this, right? And so um, as we talk about bias, there's two main types that we think of. There's the explicit and conscious bias that we have. So let's be clear, some of our bias is not hidden from us. Some of it is right out in the open. And that's when we're aware of our feelings. Um, it may align with your values or upbringing. It can affect your behaviors. And your, your, your explicit bias can be a positive or a negative. For example, if I looked over to that woman with the blanket over her shoulders and thought, she reminds me of my grandmother. Um, I may have an explicit bias toward her that makes me want to protect her, right? But we'll be focused more today on our implicit or unconscious bias, right? It's not in our conscious thoughts. It's um, connected to social stereotypes often in what we see every day. It very well may not align with your values or upbringing. It is common and it can affect our behaviors and it can be a positive thing or a negative thing. So let's just make this even more practical for you, right? Um, so when I say peanut butter, you say jelly. That is, if you grew up in the United States and you are in environments where peanut butter and jelly go together, right? And that's how our implicit bias works. What happens is we develop these mental shortcuts that we see things that are paired together and they kind of go together. Peanut butter goes with jelly, right? Um, Ordinary mental functioning is something that we, we do normally. It, it is something that allows us to move through our day more quickly. It's unavoidable and it's really built from your life experiences. Certainly there is somebody probably on this, on this uh, session today who's like, I didn't grow up in the US and you know what? Peanut butter and jelly means nothing to me or maybe it now means something to you because you've been here for so long. Originally, it was a survival mechanism, right? If you were a hunter gatherer and an animal came in your direction with teeth bared and snarling at you, you might not reach out to pet it. It might send you into fight or flight because your implicit bias says snarling teeth, um, growling means danger. I mean, it may not align with your explicit values or feelings. And again, as I mentioned to you before, we often think of bias, implicit bias, as having a negative connotation, but sometimes we can have positive um, things that we do for people because of our bias, but it can also cause someone else to be left on the outside as we um, favor another person. So here's one more example. If someone says white hair, um, you often think white hair aging, right? Except um, sometimes white hair is because somebody dyed their hair white and it's not because they're aging at all. And so these, these mental shortcuts that we have, they can often help us move more quickly through life, but sometimes they can fail us like in this instance here. So I'd like you to take a moment to just think a little bit about some of the images that you'll see before you now. What does this image conjure for you? 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 Now I'll pause for a moment on this image here because some may look at this image and think, oh my goodness, this looks like some people about to fight, maybe a gang? I don't know, it really depends on your lived experience. My lived experience is as a black woman who attended two historically black institutions, 
who is a fourth generation graduate of Tuskegee University, where my father pledged Omega Sci Fi, the fraternity of guys that's standing here on this picture. When I see this image, I feel joy and happiness. I think of college homecoming. I think of my dad and my husband, both of whom are members of this organization. But that is really because of my lived experience, right? So how you feel about something like black men, um, obese people, transgender, genderqueer, non-binary persons, Confederate flags, right? Some people see Confederate flags and they feel warm inside, happy, joy, pride even. And that has to do with our life experiences. And so um, it's important to point out that sometimes what we see and how we react and what we say has much to do with the life lens that we have and what we don't see can also be a result of, the, the, of our life lens. And so it's important to think about how our life lenses play into where, where, how we see bias, right? So I want to show you something quickly. I want you to look at these names and ask yourself, how many of these names are familiar to me? Art Garfunkel, Kai Rizdahl, Bonnie Raitt, Terry Gross, James Taylor, Carly Simon, Steely Dan, George Harrison. Maybe most of you um, know exactly who these folks are, but depending upon your life lens, you may not know at all. I'm going to show you some very familiar names um, in Black culture uh, that, that you may know or you may not know. These are often household names for Black Americans. Kiki Shepard, Jill Scott, Mia Long, Charlie Wilson, Florida Evans, Elle DeBarge, Donnie Hathaway. Now, it is possible that some of you have no idea who any of these people are. And admittedly for me, as a Black American with my life lens and lived experiences, I just can't believe that people don't know exactly who all these folks are, right? And so um, here's just one more step to take where I want you to take a look at um, the things that you do and don't consider every single day. Because again, this is how our life lens plays out. This is how, um, how microaggressions and bias plays out. Because if your lived experience, or if you have the privilege of a lived experience that doesn't call for you to consider certain things, you may miss it altogether. So just take a moment to look at this list and ask yourself, what do I always have to think about? And on this same list, what do I really never have think about? You may never think about your religious expression, right? But you may wear hijab and think, you know what? I think about that every single day. You may talk in a way that doesn't draw attention to yourself. But there are other people who talk, think about how they talk all the time. Maybe they, English is not their first language. Maybe they're somebody like me who grew up in environments where they spoke um, an African-American vernacular most of the time. And they have to think about that all the time. Do you think about how your hair is perceived? Every time my garage door opens and my black husband or black sons come home, I'm always super relieved. Thinking about my loved one's safety is something that I consider all the time. And that plays into bias in our life lens and who we are willing to defend. For example, I work at Grady Hospital, like many people um, who come from different backgrounds. But again, as I mentioned, my lived experience is as a black woman married um, to a black man. And these are my two teen sons who are even older than this now. I'm a descendant of slavery. And so some of the lived experiences and how I respond to certain things um, are, are because of that life lens. Um, I mentioned to you already that I'm a graduate of historically black colleges, which had a great deal to do with my life lens. My kids wear their hair in, you know, Afrocentric hairstyles. So I think about how they are perceived by a white heteronormative world. One of my best friends here um, and a colleague is um, a same gender loving black man and how I respond to things that they relate to the LGBTQIA plus community is shaped by that. Um, again, how I think about black men has much to do with my lived experience with black men, but still, like all of you, I'm working with medical students, residents, patients from everywhere. So constantly I'm having to think about what does all of this mean? My life lens is you take all of that, pour it into me, and then have me go out onto the wards and care for patients with these students, it could be completely different than you. What we see in everyday culture also has a lot to do with um, our, our, our biases as well, right? This is an image that was on the MARTA train um, in, great, in Atlanta, Georgia, a young woman who um, you know, lacked impulse control and was you know, on a, caught on video. Um, this is what um, an image that came up when I Googled 6 p.m. news criminal. Um, this is um, an image if you were to Google meth addict images 
Um, so these images start to come into our head. We start to associate what we see with who people are. And even in um, the, the larger media, even something as simple as um, a cartoon in a major magazine, um, this is an image of, um, of Serena Williams, um, a caricature of Serena Williams after um, she reacted um, to a loss to a game that was actually not fair. But this was this is what how she was perceived and people thought this was funny. And so the messages that we get, they play into our bias as well, right? Um, these are real Googles that I screenshot. Um, if you Google happy people, this is what they look like, um, with the exception of the one brother in the middle over here. He looks pretty happy. For the most part, um, the image that you see of what happy looks like in people is this. Beautiful women. This is what beautiful women look like. I know a lot of beautiful women, um, and, and some in my family. I mean, with the exception of Halle Berry down here in the corner, um, you know, really, um, beautiful women is, 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 is means white. Poor people. Um, Googled poor people, and this is what you saw. Um, all people of color. And so if you start to think about that peanut butter and jelly reference, right? Poor people and people of color, beautiful people and people who um, are, are um, white. Um, th these are things that start to play into who we protect and how we respond. So you start to ask yourself, well, you know what? I see all of that, Dr. Manning, but you know what, real talk, I am not biased. Am I biased? How can I tell? Here's the thing, spoiler alert, no matter who you are, if you're watching this, if you are living your life, walking around, you are, you are biased, right? So. The question is, how can I dig deeper and find out more? So many of you are familiar with something called Project Implicit. Um, the IAT, Implicit Association Test, is a validated tool, has been criticized by some, but is it a test that looks at associations? Um, and so um, more than 10 million people have been tested using this, and they look at common patterns. For example, um, how quickly would you click peanut butter with jelly, right? So then the question also becomes, how quickly would you click bad with a black person with a black face um, and then they reverse it and see how much time it takes you to make associations which are the ones that could suggest bias right and so what happens is um, after you complete a, an implicit association test what they do is they show you what most respondents said right so this one in particular um, was um, what was one where they looked at where you stand in terms of um, the you know, your, your, your preference for European American versus African American, right? So in this particular one, someone says, your data suggests you have a strong automatic preference for European American compared to African American. And it goes on to show you that, hey, you know what? Um, most people felt the same way, like 27% of people that we tested. And just a tiny percent, 2% of people actually have um, a preference for black people compared to white people. And that's, that, that's telling, right? So that's how it works. And so um, what I want to bring to your attention are there's a few more examples of, of the types of tests they have. White versus black, um, young over old, thin over obese, attractive over unattractive and vice versa. So trying to see what, where do you have biases or what they describe as strong automatic preferences, moderate automatic preferences, neutral preference. So I think everybody should try to predict of themselves. Like, do you think you have any automatic preferences? Because remember, implicit biases may not align with what we think, right? And since it doesn't align with what we think, um, it's important to kind of go through this exercise. What do you think you would um, your your automatic um, preference would be for white people versus black people, gay people or straight people, obese people or thin people, cisgender, transgender, older, younger, dark skin, light skin? I felt fairly sure of what mine would be for most of these, you know, because I'm a good person. I know that I'm gonna be neutral on all the things that could be like perceived as not nice. Um, but um, I think it's important for us to reveal to others what our biases are to really get us um, to see what it looks like to work through bias. And so here are my results from um, implicit association tests. I had a moderate to strong preference, um, automatic preference for black people. And that makes sense given my, um, my life lens, right? Um, I grew up in Inglewood, which in a predominantly black neighborhood. I went to two historically black um, institutions, Meharry and Tuskegee. Um, and then um, residency at 25 was really my first lived experience as a, a minority um, in a group, right? So that makes sense. 
Um, gay people, um, straight people, I had a, a moderate automatic preference for straight people, which was something that I thought would be was kind of surprising. I expected slight to neutral given um, my, my interactions with other people. Obese people, thin people, I had a strong automatic preference for thin people. Cisgender, um, I had a moderate automatic preference for cisgender. Had a, um, a moderate automatic preference for younger people. And this was the one that I took like five times over and over again, you guys. Um, I actually had a moderate automatic preference for lighter skin um, versus darker skin. I even like tried to wait a month and take it again. Um, but the same thing kept happening. And that is such a clear example of how when I look at my husband and my sons, both of whom do not have light skin, all of whom do not have light skin, I just realized that it doesn't necessarily line up with what I think um, I would do. So what does that mean? What it means is that as we live our lives, our lived experiences, our life lenses, and also as we look at media, turn on the TV, watch movies, look at billboards, right? Um, we are like this tofu and this world around us is like a broth and everything that's in the broth, we just soak it up and take up the flavor whether we want to or not, right? And that's really how implicit bias works. But a better way to think of it is that bias affects who we protect who we suspect, who we reject, and particularly as physicians and um, as clinician educators, the data that we are willing to collect about people. What questions are we willing to ask? What benefit of the doubt are we willing to give someone, right? Bias plays into that. So I just wanna share a few types of bias for us to think about, um, just to make sure that we have this language in, in shared. So there's affinity bias, and affinity bias is when you have a bias toward those who are more like you. Right. Um, and so, for example, when I was standing in that emergency department and I saw that older African American woman and I identified with her because of my life lens, that's an affinity bias. She might be someone who might get the best of me. Right. Attribution bias is that you look at someone and you decide that because of who they are or that, that they are and what they're doing, they're likely doing something because of your, your, your stereotypical idea of who that person is. For example, might have been an attribution bias. Um, if, that, if I went over to that young white man and he said anything to me, anything he said, I would, might attribute it to whatever bias I have toward him, right? Stereotyping, that's this idea where you, you, you decide what, who people are before you talk to them, right? So you have this idea of who a black woman is. And um, if I do anything that aligns with that narrative, you attribute it to that, or you assume that I'm going to take on that stereotype. And stereotype threat actually is another piece of that where the individual starts to sort of live into that as well. It's, it's a very complicated thing. Racial bias um, speaks for itself. Um, it's bias against people of other races. Disability bias is not talked about enough, but it's an important one. That woman who was screaming in the emergency department, um, her mental health issues was certainly a disability. And I felt um, inside of me that it is possible that I do have a disability bias, disability bias against her. And it's worth considering. Gender bias is very well described when we think of often. And then I want to bring to your attention something called blind spot bias, which is this idea that just be, you just don't think you have any bias. It's like, I don't have any bias. I don't see color. I don't see, you know, I, I, I don't see men or women or non-binary folk. I just, I just see people. Um, but we all have bias because we live and we, and we breathe and we experience and we have our life lenses. And then don't forget about beauty bias, which is worth mentioning, which is why I showed you those images of beautiful people, because many people have a strong automatic preference and will be forgiving or sometimes less forgiving of people because of how they look. So what can we do to mitigate our bias, right? Okay, so you heard all those things. You're like, okay, now what, what can I do? So first of all, we start big, right? 30,000 foot lens and we think about institutional strategies. Things like implicit bias training, which I'm sure they do at UCSD, but also bringing someone to talk to you about bias um, at Grand Rounds is the kind of thing on an institutional level that you can do. Um, objective hiring practices, extremely important. What does your, um, your search committees look like? Um, are they diverse? Um, and who, who, who in, your, in your search groups, um, who's on the search groups? Do you have at least two minorities there? Um, do you have more? Um, the likelihood of you ever filling a position with somebody who's underrepresented um, comes from how many people you have in your applicant pool. And that's important and very well described. 
um, reviews out, review outcomes for evaluation and promotion, um, making sure to make it as objective as possible. Um, why is it that we have 38,074 full professors, but only 270 of them are Black women? Probably because somewhere in the evaluation and promotion process, um, people fall off and we have to find ways to make that objective. And then promoting bias literacy. Some of the things we just already talked about just now where we unpack some of those different types of bias and you're thinking like, gosh, I never really thought about that. This is really the kind of thing that we can do institutionally. Now, individual strategies are the ones that we can do today. Anybody can do this. So it starts with some self-awareness and take that implicit association test. Many of you have taken them before, but I think taking it and then in the context of what knowledge you now have about um, implicit bias, I think is incredibly important. Um, reflection exercises about our biases, um, writing about them, having conversations. Um, we do storytelling events at Emory that, um, that really help us to kind of reflect on the, 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 world, the world we live in and, and often our life lenses. Um, perspective taking and empathy building, moments where you take a moment to think about what would this outcome be if this were somebody different? How would I feel about this student and what they're doing if they were a Black woman or if they were a white man, right? And then um, discretion elimination, um, that is kind of tricky sometimes in medicine, but it has been very well described where you sort of blind um, blind yourself um, from, from certain aspects of who a person is. The Probably the best described, which many of you have heard of, is um, in um, when they were doing symphony um, auditions, I believe it was the New York Symphony, but I could be wrong, um, where instead of um, having people come in, sit down and play their instrument, they put them behind a curtain, had them remove their shoes so you couldn't even hear heels clicking on the ground and just had them play. And, and, and with that discretion eliminated, you just, all you can do is just listen to the music for what it is, right? And then um, I want to highlight building new associations and being okay with awkward. This um, awesome uh, medical student now resident um, was the first trans woman that I ever worked with in a clinical environment. And I have to say that there were some very, very awkward moments and some microaggressions that I'm sad to say that I committed. But thanks to her patience and her being um, so open and willing during my awkward period, um, it really helped me grow quite a bit. The next piece I want to mention is about risk factors and bias landmines. So when are your biases most likely to play out, right? So they're likely to play out in certain emotional states. You frazzled right now. Something just happened in your household. You running out late to clinic and dropped your coffee and realized that your kid left their backpack in your backseat and you're pulling into the hospital parking lot. Those certain emotional states those are times when your bias can come out. When something is ambiguous, what's the rule on this thing? Um, you know, bias plays in low cognitive effort processing, where you're just kind of going through the motions of something over and over. An example that I that I had to call out a bias for myself on recently was I was scoring um, posters for abstracts, and I was I was looking at them one after the next, after the next, after the next. And when I got to about the tenth or twelfth one, I really had to take a break and say, you know what? I think my bias could be starting to kick in here, and I could be starting starting to be a little less objective. Distraction is another big one. When you're tired, when you are hungry, hangry, y'all, um, and then when you're rushing and high pressure, these are the times of what I call bias landmines, when it's likely to come out and, 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 and stand in the way of you doing right by your patients, your students, um, and those around you. I'd like to draw um, um, your attention to this image, which really just kind of underscores a lot of what I already mentioned. This is from uh, Dr. Jasmine Marcelin, who wrote in the Journal of Infectious Diseases about implicit bias. And she was just kind of showing you how um, the strategies to mitigate unconscious bi bias are those system things or those institutional things like leadership commitment to culture change, meaningful diversity training, what that looks like. Um, there, there's individual things like self-reflection on your personal biases, which is kind of like what I'm doing in this talk, telling you out loud about my personal biases, and it's critically important for leaders to do that. Question um, and actively counter stereotypes. Recent example, we had an individual um, that was uh, looking at one of our, our um, training programs, and somebody was, was advocating for the individual. And we had to pause for a moment and say, what if the person who was advocating for this individual was not Black? What if the individual they were advocating for was not Black? What if both of these individuals um, were white men? How would this be met? How would we think about it? How likely would we be to give the person a chance? 
mentorship and sponsorship, cultural humility, which is broadening that life lens, and then intentionally diversifying our experiences. Those are all things that we can do. So I want to share this little study with you. Um, it was a study that looked at um, judges um, who were doing parole hearings. And every day they had a schedule where they did parole hearings all morning, took a lunch break, and then did some more in the afternoon. Um, the closer they got um, to the meal, like when they were hungry, um, 60, they were 65% uh, less likely to, to give you parole when they were hungry, but then 65% more likely to offer parole after meals. So those pre-meal parole sentences um, were nearly zero. That's, that's significant, right? It shows you how when you're hungry and you're distracted, that's a biased landmine, right? And so, and then I'll give you another more practical example of my lived experience at Emory. And so um, I, as a, a faculty member, I also precept in the internal medicine clinic. And on this day in the internal medicine clinic, I was uh, working with some residents. It was a really busy morning. Um, we had about four residents um, per attending. Um, and it was crazy that morning. And I was also working with a colleague who was working kind of slow. So I was kind of frustrated about that. It was probably about 1150. I had a conference call that was coming up at 1230. We're trying to wrap up all the loose ends. It was a really crazy morning. And one of our patient access representatives comes to the back and asked me, Dr. Manning, um, we have a patient here who had an 1130 appointment, um, but she's late. Can we check her in? Her name is, um, and, I, and I give you an alias, is um, Ms. Jonquavius Moore. Now, Jonquavius Moore, when I heard the name, right, because name bias is also a real thing, I decided that I knew who Jonquavius Moore was. I decided Jonquavius Moore is the name of probably someone Black, probably someone young. And why is this young person unable to get here to this appointment at 1130? It isn't even at the crack of dawn. And so I started to immediately say, no, just tell her she needs to reschedule. But the next thing I need to do is then unpack my own biases. Am I near a biased landmine? Yes, I was near a biased landmine. I was really, really busy. I was being rushed. Um, I was being asked about something that was rather ambiguous. While we do have a policy about late um, people coming to clinic late, um, she was sort of right on the edge of where that was, right? Um, and then I had to take a moment and say, well, what if instead of you being John Quavius Moore, your name was Willie Mae Jones? Now, Willie Mae Jones in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, Willie Mae, that's somebody's grandmama. Willie Mae probably was counting on her grandson to drop her off and something happened. I didn't care what was going on with Willie Mae. Willie Mae was getting checked in. And see, that, that is what bias looks like. So what I did was that I got up from the chair and walked to the front of the clinic to meet John Quavius Moore, who, as I would find out, was a person with me multiple medical problems who had been in the Coumadin clinic that morning and held over, right? But if I had just gone by that snap judgment from my, from my own bias, um, she wouldn't have been checked in and wouldn't have been seen that morning. And so hunger and all that <laughs> really play into those, those biases, right? So just to recap that to you guys one more time, recognizing those certain emotional states, low cognitive effort processing, being distracted, being hungry, and being rushed and in high pressure situations. That is when bias comes out in full force and actually impacts our actions, right? So back to the emergency department, let's go back to where we were um, in that moment and think about all of the things that were happening in that little snapshot that I gave you, right? I have to unpack my own biases. But then um, this exercise of asking, am I near a biased landmine? I told you we were on long call that day. We've been rounding all morning. It'd been a crazy morning. It was about 1150. The residents needed to go to conference. Lots of things at play that could put me in a biased landmine, right? So in that moment, in real time, what I can do is check my emotional state. Where am I? What are my known triggers um, before I go and see these patients now? How can I slow down um, so that the patient that I'm about to see doesn't get the worst of me? Um, I can tell somebody that I trust about my biases, right? Um, because sometimes, you know, it, it can be nerve wracking to actually tell someone out loud, this is what my bias is. Um, but it can also help you um, to, to, to mitigate them in a better way and also find ways to broaden your life lens. You can adjust your schedule to mitigate your biases. So in that moment, I could say, you know, 
if the patient that they are about to ask me to see right now um, is somebody for whom I know I have either an explicit or implicit bias, if it is non-emergent, what I could do is wait until after conference to come back and see this patient and give them um, the better version of me, like those parole officers, right? And then calling yourself out for your bias is gonna be really important. Um, on my teams, I want to share something that we, that we do um, on my teams, and it's called bias rounds. And bias rounds is just like folded into all the things that we're already doing every day. Um, we run our list um, to think about as we shape our day in the morning where bias could play out, right? And we think about this also with errors and everything too. We think about sort of what 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 is the dynamic of our day and where do, where are we at risk? Now you must have psychological safety on your team to be able to do such a thing because you're going to be sort of showing your um, the aspects of who you are that maybe not be may not be so flattering. But what we do is we run through the list. We look at the list and we say, you know, we have 15 patients today. It's a lot of patients today. Um, we have five patients who are really sick. Um, one person, one of our residents is in clinic today. Um, Dr. Manning has to teach small group at 1 p.m. We have a lot of things that we could be up against. Um, how should we structure our day? Now, if you are, have real psychological safety in your team, you can talk about your potential biases, how you can adapt the day to mitigate your biases and keeping the dialogue open. So saying, I, I've said to my team, I have a strong um, automatic preference for people who are not obese. I'd like to go see this gentleman first. Um, because I don't want to wait until the end of rounds to see him. And then returning as a team to reflect is important. And so um, my explicit and implicit biases, as mentioned to you guys before, I probably have a bias that is in favor of this woman. Um, I probably had a bias against this gentleman. Um, I uh, come from Inglewood, California, and so I feel um, an affinity toward individuals who speak Spanish. Um, the screaming woman for psychosis, I identify that I may have even an explicit disability bias against her that I need to work through. Um, the young black man in custody for various reasons, especially right now, um, I, I have a, a preference in his favor. Um, and then the nurse with the high BMI, because of my implicit bias that I know from the IAT, um, I may be short with her, right? Um, these are things that I now know. And so asking yourself in your own time, what did you feel, I think is an important exercise for all of us. I want to shift quickly in the last bit of time that we have here um, to talk a little bit about how we take our implicit bias that we've learned about and really transform what we do. This was a paper in academic medicine published in January of 20, and it looked at something called the transformative learning theory and said, how can we take the things we learn and make them into something where we change? The transformative learning theory was described in the 70s. It's not a new thing, but when um, laid upon um, um, bias, um, it's it's a really um, important way to look at it. And what is it? What does a transformative le learning theory, a transformative learning theory, um, look like? It starts with the disruption and revised interpretation. Maybe in this talk, I've said something that has disrupted your thinking, made you think like, hmm, I never thought about my life lens. Leads to critical reflection as you think about that more, right? Um, and then talking to other people about it ultimately leads to the action and that transformation and how you change not your only yourself individually, but also culture. I want to show you this. Um, and um, then we'll be close to wrapping up. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you gonna have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Give me shopping so advice. I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every damn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, Can I, I touch, touch your it? Hair? Please. Oh my God. Oh my God. Can I please? Oh my God. 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 Oh
annoying and makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes, which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow. Dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. Okay, so microaggression. So you've heard this term before, but I want to peel it apart a little bit more for you um, in this last bit of time that we have. So microaggressions can be broken into three different types. Um, micro invalidations, which are those things that, you know, you, you sort of hear people say, but they, they, they kind of other, other individuals, things like, oh, I don't see color, or, um, hey, pass me the skin color crayon, which was something that I used to hear in elementary school often um, to, to describe a peach colored um, crayon, which wasn't my skin color at all. There's micro insults, those things that people say that may be related to their stereotype um, thinking of you, um, often not intentional things like, um, oh, wow, you're really articulate, which suggests that um, they don't think that someone from your group really should speak as you do. Um, I would have never thought you went to an HBCU, um, which then suggests that um, you, that would be some a place where someone would not come out like me, right? And then micro assaults are a little more direct. They tend to be things like um, things I heard in residency. Don't go all shenane on me, Dr. Manning. Or um, you know this, where can I get the best fried chicken? Every single thing that I listed here are things that I've heard and experienced. And that's kind of how microaggressions work. And it's a word that sometimes gets some criticism, but is um, a word that I like to think of as disruptive and fits nicely into that transformative learning theory. So when someone commits a microaggression, which is really rooted in bias, what can happen next? Because I think it's really important to think about what we can do. So sometimes the, the first thing you can do is depending upon your personality, you can just be direct, call it right out. Hey, that wasn't cool. When you said that, um, that was a hurtful thing. That, that's, that's not okay. Um, you can distract. Um, someone might be saying something and you say, okay, let's just change the subject, guys. Let's move on and not talk about this anymore. You can delegate if you're a medical student and because of where you are in the hierarchy, right, you might say, well, you know what, um, I'm going to go back and speak to my attending and say, this thing happened, I witnessed it, um, and I, I, I want I want to make sure that this resident or this person on our team is safe. Delay is where you come back to the individual and say, Kimberly, I saw what someone said about suggesting you would know where to find fried chicken. Um, and I, I just wanna make sure you're okay and let you know that I did not think that was cool. But also um, I added in something that I think I've never seen like written anywhere and it's this display of discomfort. If someone um, on the opposite end of microaggressions often, and as someone who has committed a microaggression, one of the most painful pieces when you talk to people is that um, when individuals act like nothing happened, the loneliness of being othered and, and feeling like nobody saw. So what does that look like? It can just be something as simple as a facial expression that says, yo, did y'all hear that? Or you know, if you wanna be a little more direct and depending upon to who you are, you can be like, hey, man, that was not okay. And sometimes you want a person who likes confrontation and feels ready to actually say something. But this can go a long way, even eye contact with the individual that says, I saw that. And then you could come back later through delay to let them know that you support them. So as a final example, this is MJ, a medical student working on your team. And uh, she's a trans woman and she's doing a great job. She is really excited to be doing medicine with you and thinks she wants to go into internal medicine. But then you start to notice that this dynamic that's happening, right? This, um, this stereotype thing that's happening where every time um, people are talking to MJ, they're asking her questions like, hey, do you watch the show Pose? Um, hey, do you know how to Vogue? Um, and, and even talking in these exaggerated ways that they assume that she would talk because uh, she's a trans woman. Uh, MJ doesn't even watch TV. She's never seen the show Pose, so she read about it in a magazine. It's not something, she doesn't know how to Vogue. She doesn't, she has two left feet. Um, and as this keeps happening over and over again, it can be a very subtle thing, but if your life lens does not um, even include someone like MJ, you could think of all of this as nothing. It's just kind of funny little things that are happening. 
And so then um, after doing this, um, this talk, right, being a part of this talk, um, and, and as we think about that transformative learning theory, we can now think about well, what biases are at play, what could, what could be happening here, and then what are the microaggressions that are being committed against, um, against MJ? You might be just waiting for someone to say something really explicit, but a lot of those microaggressions um, will not come out in the form of a direct assault. It can be those little micro insults, right? And then how can you be an upstander remembering those five D's, even something starting with looking at MJ and being like, yo, that is not cool, right? So beyond the IAT, as we make our implicit and explicit more, um, more explicit to each other, ask yourself these questions. Who am I? What am I afraid of? What am I afraid other people are afraid of? Who am I trying to protect? Who am I not trying to protect? What am I mad at? And right now that's very significant for me. What am I sad at? That's significant too. What makes me feel at home? What makes me feel lost? What makes me feel super awkward? Here's your homework. If you've not gone to Project Implicit to do IAT testing, or if you've done it before and it's been a minute, go and do it. Watch out for blind spot bias. You biased. Don't, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I don't care how nice you are. You, I, I'm, a, I'm a diversity, equity, and inclusion lead, and I am biased. Um, Talk to a trusted colleague about your biases. Maybe you could talk to about 200 people like I'm doing now. Check your emotional and physical state. Know those landmines, right? Walk down in the emergency department, look around and say, yo, you know what? I'm hungry and I'm rushed and I'm worried about this lecture that I'm giving at UCSD tomorrow and I wanna do a good job. If this is not emergent, I'm gonna wait until after that because I'll be in a better space to give you my best. Um, make an adjustment to workflow when you can. Take a moment to reflect on an incident where you could have done better and keep trying. In summary, implicit bias is pervasive. We all have it. Environmental factors, they cause our biases. It's our life lens. We're the tofu and we are just soaking up the broth, y'all. Implicit biases don't align with our values and implicit biases can affect our actions and our decisions. And they can lead to microaggressions. And remember, the one thing you do not need for something to be a microaggression is um, intention. Just because you didn't mean for it to land a certain way don't mean that it was not a microaggression. Implicit biases can be mitigated through individual and institutional strategies. Something like having me here to talk to you is one of them. Awareness can be powerful and associations with diverse groups, health and individual relationships really do matter. This is um, Dr. Leslie Miller. Um, she is um, one of our, uh, she runs our um, liver and hepatitis C clinic at Grady. She's a close friend of mine. She's a white woman from upstate New York who's Jewish and her life lens and lived experience is completely different than mine, but she has absolutely transformed the way I think about many things. And I'm sure that the same has happened for her. Remember that bias affects who we protect, who we suspect, who we reject, and the data that we are willing to collect. And that, my friends, is all I've got. It's been a pleasure talking to you this morning. Look at me with eight minutes to go. Oh, and I mentioned, I have to say the last thing. This is my dad who survived his troponin of 22. Um, that was 20 years ago um, in, um, on December 31st uh, of, of 2019. That was his 20 years um, after that um, massive MI. He was revascularized and this is us on Labor Day weekend. So he's doing great. Wonderful. Dr. Manning, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. We are so incredibly grateful to you for um, sharing this important work with us. We have a number of questions. We will try to get through as many of them as we possibly can. Okay. Um, we'll start with this one. Wonderful lecture. How often does the Department of Medicine at Emory do formalized implicit bias workshops and lectures? Is the approach different for faculty versus residents? Mm -hmm. um, great question. Um, so um, like many places, you know, we. We aren't as far along with this as we'd like to be. Um, step one, we have um, an Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Department of Medicine. Um, I'm the ABC. We have a vice chair. We both have time protected to do this work. We got implicit bias training. Um, and after we got implicit bias training, we started going by division um, to do implicit bias training. Um, anybody who sits on a um, search committee must have implicit bias training. And then for our residents, um, the difference with our residents is that quite frankly, they're more savvy than a lot of our faculty are. 
And so we don't want them to have these sort of redundant talks that, um, that don't um, look at sort of that Bloom's taxonomy, thinking that, about what they already know. Um, and so um, we folded our residents into building our anti-racism and, um, and uh, bias curriculum. And so we're in the process of building that more out. Um, but we use a lot of creative things like storytelling platforms and um, creative writing sessions and such. So um, I, I just think the main thing is to try to build culture and that calls for a strategic plan and people who are trained in the area. Thank you, Dr. Manning. There are a couple of questions that um, specifically ask um, regarding uh, power dynamics. So what advice do you have for students who experience microaggressions by attendings or people in power where it's difficult to speak out or speak up? Mm -hmm. That's really hard because like, you know, I'm a full professor and I've been at Emory for 20 years. So, um, I, you know, on those five Ds, I can use direct pretty easily, right? Um, but um, one, it doesn't necessarily, if you have an issue with an attending, you can actually go and speak to somebody else who isn't that attending. You can go over their head to a dean. Um, you can go to a mentor. So I'm a small group advisor at Emory. I've had students um, in my small groups experience microaggressions. They've come to me. Um, and um, one, I can provide support to the individual in that moment, um, but also um, depending on if I know the faculty member, we can actually talk about it a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is uh, you can also go to the senior resident, um, other members of the team uh, for support, but ultimately um, at our institution, we also have anonymous confidential ways to, to report, um, you know, microaggressions or sort of you know, incidents uh, that can happen. And, and that's a, a really important thing to be able to offer people. Thank you. There are a couple of questions related to addressing microaggressions. Mm -hmm. um, so one specifically asks, um, I recently attended a lecture on addressing microaggressions that said specifically not to ask if someone was okay later because it might cause them to re-experience the event without really addressing the cause. And then a similar, uh, along a similar vein, when disrupting bias, do you feel there is harm if allies delay since no one but the person experiencing the microaggression gets to see their allyship? So um, some uh, questions those are, are. Those are such good questions. Um, and so, you know, I think it offers me, a, for the first question, it offers me a point of clarification. Um, you know, I, I think the delay piece isn't just about, are you okay? Um, the delay piece is, I saw that. I saw what happened to you. And I am acknowledging and value and, um, and, and, and placing value upon who you are and saying, I see you. Um, so if that alone as a delay is great. Um, I think the other piece um, to mention as well is, um, um, I think it was, um, you said, do, do I um, worry that um, coming back and asking somebody later um, could, could, could be like, a, a bad thing um, or do more harm later. Um, yeah, you know, so, sometimes the, the most hurtful thing for me when I've been on the opposite end of a microaggression is nobody acknowledging it at all. Um, you know, sometimes there are things that are so acute that um, somebody coming to you later and saying, oh man, you know, that was really bad what happened in private. You're like, dang, you know, I really needed an ally in that moment, but it still feels better than nothing. So, I mean, silence to me is always the worst possible thing. I'll just mention quickly, um, I was a visiting professor at a really prestigious institution sitting at a dinner with like 30 people. And um, a dean looked at me and was talking to me about Meharry and asked me, you know, flat out said, you know, you know, we want to get more diversity here. Like, how can we like find the ones like you, the ones that are like going to be scrappy and that are like the diamonds in the rough? Said it to my face. It was 30 people there. I looked all around the table. Nobody even made eye contact with me. And then when the dinner was over, I stood to the side and hoped somebody would come by and say, man, you know what? I'm so sorry that happened to you. Um, nobody did. People just sort of waved and said bye. And as I walked back to my hotel room, I was crying, thinking to myself, all I would have wanted was for somebody to say what they said. But now I'm older, so I was actually able to stand up for myself and say, you know, I don't think I'm a diamond in the rough. I think that the rough is in the eye of who's been looking at me. But that's because I'm 50. <laughs> if that had happened to me when I was 30, um, you know, and it was still hurtful enough to make me cry. Thank you, Dr. Manning. Another question, can you speak to how best to acknowledge or apologize 
um, or communicate to people if you realize that you've just committed a microaggression toward them? Oh, I have lived experience with that, my friend. So when I was working with the, um, my student um, um, who's a trans woman, like I, I probably committed so many microaggressions. And then after a while, I would be like in real time realizing that I did. Um, and, and I was just honest because, you know, that's where that psychological safety piece comes in. You have to work at any relationship to create, um, you know, a dynamic that lets people know you care about them. And, and you know, I, I just, I said, I was sorry. I said, you know, Holly, this is the, you're the first um, trans woman that I've ever worked with. And um, I think my life lens has caused me to have some gigantic blind spots um, that, you know, I really, I, I want to do better and I, and I want you to be able to do your job. So it created this space where she used to just be calling me out left and right. She'd be like, listen, I feel like you're trying too hard to use my pronouns. Like, I feel like you fighting to like find ways to, can you just kind of calm down? I'm like, damn, okay. Um, it, it went all the way to the other way, right? But creating these spaces where we can just be open with one another, um, I think it's just an awesome place to start. You know, anytime somebody do something to you, if they say sorry and they're sincere, it's your, either you're going to accept the apology or you're not. Yeah. Excellent. And you can't move on. Thank you. Another question. How does your educational effort extend to other staff, such as nurses, social workers, et cetera? Do you include these staff in your trainings? Do you address the biases and hierarchy in your training? Oh, yes. Um, so, okay, first part is um, staff. So our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, council in the Department of Medicine, it includes staff. Um, and so we have people representing, um, like, people from HR, people from all different parts of the department. Um, and, and the unique needs of people who are in staff positions is very different than the physicians and um, the trainees. Um, so we, we do have sort of an affinity group that focuses on that. And we curate um, our sessions to allow open dialogue for the things specific to people. Um, and for nursing, um, though that is not under the purview of us in the Department of Medicine, we have a much larger umbrella in the School of Medicine, which um, also includes, um, which connects with our, our College of Nursing at Emory um, and a lot of interprofessional work as well. And so um, our, we, we have had many of our nursing um, teams and staff and advanced practice providers participate in our um, bias and bystander, upstander um, sessions and trainings. It's, it, it's definitely, you, it, for it to be a culture thing, you gotta include everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. One last question. There are many more, but one last one that we have time for. How do you follow up with faculty or colleagues who are anonymously reported to have committed a microaggression? What is the feedback process like? That's hard, right? I mean, it's, it's like similar to when stuff happens if you're a residency program director and somebody does something and you have to go and say something. Um, it depends on what it is. Um, sometimes if it's something um, if we get a few things and they all seem to be kind of similar, we'll address it in front of everybody. Um, um, maybe in our DEI newsletter, um, we will call individual, um, we'll go to the residency program and kind of talk about it in our conference. Um, you know, really finding ways to sort of discuss it on open. Like if it's a direct thing, if it says, I was working with Dr. Kimberly Manning and Dr. Kimberly Manning did this and I didn't know another way to say anything about it. So then for us from um, Dr. Buzzy Jones and myself from the DEI office, um, we'll, we'll contact our, our, our colleague and, and talk to them about it. I, I, I do wanna also point out that, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of cancel culture. Like, you know, the thing about bias is that everybody has it and you are going to mess up. Um, and because you are going to mess up, we have to create a space for people to mess up and, and, and be able to correct. Um, and, and, and so, um, you know, learning how to have those conversations with people so that they don't just feel, get so high on the hind legs that they want to fight um, is important. Like, I don't want to publicly embarrass or shame you. What I want to do is I want to think about that transformative learning theory and I want to disrupt your thinking, cause you to critically reflect. We can have the dialogue and then ultimately you'll do better. And, and I'm honest about my own biases and microaggressions that I have committed to recognize, thank goodness, that my student who worked with me on that experience, thank goodness she gave me an opportunity to apologize and to do better. And it has completely changed the way I interact with trans women and trans men and non-binary people because of her broadening of my life lens. And that's that piece that's so important about building relationships and broadening the life lens through experience. 
And then finally, Dr. Manning, uh, there are many notes of appreciation here, but I'll read this one from one of our students. Thank you, Dr. Manning, for the labor and love that you've put into this lecture. I appreciate your storytelling. And I think that that definitely um, speaks on behalf of all of us in the audience. We are so grateful to you um, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to speak to us. And um, as one of our faculty members has said, uh, this amazing and educational talk is inspiring all of us to get started on our homework. <laughs> Thank no, you, but I'm still Dan. working on my homework too. So um, we are definitely all in this together. So please know that it's a work in progress and to be kind to yourselves and don't cancel people, you know, give them a chance to, 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 um, to work through it and to do better. Thank you so much, Dr. Manning. We look forward to having you visit again when you can come in person. Yes, bring me to the ocean, y'all. I promise you we will. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye, Summer Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manning. See ya. Uh, bye.